Well, hello and welcome to an art talk with uh, Montreal-based artist Douglas Scholes. Uh, we had the privilege of putting up at Galerie Robertson Arais a uh, solo exhibition called Sightlines. So Douglas Scholes, welcome. Thank you. I'm pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Right on. Well, we've known each other for, for many years. We've participated in exhibitions. We've worked together. And uh, one thing I have to say about Doug, for people who don't know him, is his attention to detail and uh, the high quality of pretty much everything that Doug puts his hands on. So it's a true privilege to, uh, to work with somebody like Doug and to work with Doug. Uh, you're originally from you. Montreal but uh, mm -hmm. you uh, grew up elsewhere and then you came back to Montreal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background, where you're from and uh, where you did your studies? Yeah, well, I'm actually a child of the uh, mass uh, Anglo exodus uh, in the late seventies when uh, after the changeover happened, the political changeover happened in Quebec, my family, which is all really from Ontario, my, my uh, relatives are all living in Southern Ontario. Uh, my immediate family, my mom and dad, we moved back to uh, Ontario, went to Barrie, and I stayed there for a number of years, trying to hold on to whatever French I, uh, you know, I accumulated over the years of uh, 16 years in, in uh, Montreal, and um, ended up uh, schooling there, um, meeting, you know, all my high school friends, uh, my wife, uh, we were, we have a, you know, a very strong network of people in that area. Uh, I ended up uh, in my schooling going out to uh, the West and to Lethbridge in Alberta, where I did my bachelor's in Alberta. And I decided that um, I wanted to go and uh, try and express, or at least be back in my, my place of birth. So I wanted to go back to Montreal. I applied to a couple of universities, uh, two of which were here in Montreal, one of which accepted me, which was UCAM. I did my master's uh, in uh, Maitrise en Art Visuel et Médiatique. Uh, at the time, it was a new course and uh, managed to uh, do, get, you know, do the networking and all that sort of thing that was involved in going into school and learning things and stayed in Montreal afterwards with my family and uh, my wife and my two kids. And we've been here really ever since, uh, uh, mostly in the St. Henry district of Montreal, but we've been sort of uh, living and working in, in that area since then. So. I've been to some epic schools, uh, La Mouder Christmas parties. Yeah, well, we have a lot of fun trying to bring people in and uh, use the space that I'm now sitting in as well. That becomes a, a great uh, place to welcome people uh, at a festive time, particularly when we had that opportunity to get together and gather. Um, so, yeah, we, I remember Francois being there. We. Uh, uh, we've had some good times uh, in this in this building. We've had some good times together. So, I also should say that uh, you know Francois and I, like you would said, uh, we've known each other for quite some time uh, through uh, a local uh, cultural establishment here in Montreal called the Galerie de Bellefeuille, and we worked uh, we worked together. We grew together through those kinds of experiences. Uh, Francois was uh, was uh, sort of foresight, had enough foresight to uh, move on and, and try out different things. And now with the experience here and at the Robertson Erez Gallery and uh, with Emily, I've uh, been very privileged to be able to be part of that experience and to be part of the formation too, into a certain way. So I, I kind of feel um, I feel part of uh, part of that uh, growth of the of this of this new uh, great experience. So thank well, you. you're a, you're a wealth of knowledge of many 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 parts of the <laughs> world, and uh, that actually brings me to a very interesting point: is that um, you've uh, have done a lot of residencies, uh, special programs uh, throughout Canada. Uh, you've gone to the East Coast. You've gone out west. Um, is there a particular a residency that sticks out from one that you've done uh, that really was like a real eye opener in terms of how it helped form your art career? Yeah, I, I don't know necessarily something that would stick. There are always experiences in going on residencies. One of the reasons for going actually, in fact, is to actually uh, have the challenge of uh, working in a different situation, networking and with uh, with a different group of people and a different situation, different sort of cultural background. But essentially, you get this opportunity to uh, try out some of the ideas 
and see uh, and work with them in a different location with different parameters. So, I mean, I've, I've gone to London, England. I was there for six months and that experience was the first time that I, was, I actually lived alone uh, for a lengthy period of time. I had visitors. I had my family, my wife and uh, friends, my kids came and visited me. Um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't living in my regular routine and I had to adjust and, and there's a sort of cultural adjustment that's, uh, that needs to take place. And then the work still has to happen and it all influences certain things. So uh, going to France uh, was a similar kind of thing. Uh, going out um, to Banff um, and spending time in the Rockies and um, they're all these experiences that have uh, left indelible marks on the way it is and how it is that I actually pull together the ideas and then ultimately how the uh, the work actually is formed. So uh, each one of them, like I said, I think um, they all have their sort of specific uh, uh, benefits, I guess. You take one in particular, like let's say your experience in Banff, uh, for people who don't quite know what an artist residency is about, what did you go do in Banff? How long did it last? And what was the project that were you involved in? Yeah, Banff was uh, Banff is an interesting place because it's uh, it's basically a school, and uh, they bring in uh, curators uh, to the in in the program that I was in, which was uh, uh, open uh, program for visual artists. So there was no theme. Oftentimes they have themes and you work with somebody that's so in particular with that. But I, I had a chance to meet people from all over the world, from uh, Amsterdam, Chile, uh, the United States, uh, England, um, and Canada for sure, uh, that uh, were uh, in that. And there's a really vast uh, difference in terms of approaches from sculpture, photography, performance. And you have this opportunity to work in a, in a you have a studio uh, that has a bunch of facilities uh, the Banff is uh, really well equipped for the, the kinds of things that uh, are used uh, by the arts from pottery. So there's, there's sort of a, a, a craft aspect of things as well as uh, photography and using the facilities to be able to do things. So I was concentrating more on photography and my performances where I could go out into the environment and I was looking for these uh, clandestine, what I call them clandestine dumps. And the, the, the park itself, uh, Jasper uh, National Park is, um, has a huge history. So the history of uh, people basically using the, the environment, using the space from, for uh, reasons of uh, resource management or resource uh, uh, mining as it were, whether it's uh, minerals or wood or, and uh, there's also sorts of kinds of debris that's left behind and this yeah. debris accumulates and this well, thing, we'll these things are covered we'll over. Yeah. That, yeah. So I had a really good experience of trying to express that, but also like technically just trying to explain myself in the, in the, in this sort of idea of a class where you presented the work and I hadn't done that for a long time and you had to present your work and then you had uh, these, uh, kind of critiques and and that's a particular form or particular way that a, a residency works and that one in, in particular was uh, very challenging so well we're uh, gonna put on a little presentation of uh, your show called Sightlines, and um, it, it, it does have um, some very interesting features from a number of different aspects of your artistic practice and I think that you, were, you really have a very cohesive uh, dialogue in what you're talking about and you're able to really put together some very interesting aspects from different parts of your career and still kind of evolve with all of these elements as you go by. Um, so this, the title, Sightlines, what is behind this title? What, uh, what, what gave you the idea behind it? Well, the, uh, that work actually the, that we see right now is actually the instigator in a certain way, this idea of uh, something that there's a perspective, I guess, uh, uh, a way to view things. Uh, some You're at a position, you're in a position, whether mentally or physically, and you see things and you start to uh, understand perhaps, or at least uh, uh, appreciate and are curious towards some of these things that are presented in the environment. So sight lines this the, the image here is of uh, a work that has a neon strip going through these metal pieces of steel. And it's, it's, it's an overarching uh, attempt, at least in terms of a title, for something 
to describe uh, the various kinds of approaches in um, a, a body of work that uh, that is kind of diverse. And from these very formalist kinds of works, I move into sort of the performance aspect of things too as well. And these, the, so it's, it's really just a, an, an entry point into what you see in the exhibition uh, uh, and what, uh, what's presented, what I've presented and what we pulled together, so. And as, as I heard you uh, come throughout the exhibition, we were talking about how this work was really about a play on uh, form, color, shape, uh, the, the, distant, uh, the difference between the uh, very soft, edges of the neon tube with the very rough edges of the steel cut plates. Um, yeah, I think those are those are aspects uh, certainly that are uh, intrinsic uh, to my practice actually, despite uh, the some of the appearance of certain things that are, uh, well, at least uh, my practice uh, also involving performance and video, uh, photography, uh, of and using objects in a way that uh, they're sort of not really meant to be used, but they're presented as, uh, as uh, these uh, works of art. And I think that uh, the bottom line is essentially that I come from a sculptural background and, I, and in the sculpture, in a very formalist kind of sculptural background where things, forms and shapes are dealing with color and how they're, and their relationships. Out of that, there's always an interesting kind of play that can happen. So there's, there's sort of like a balance that, is a uh, that's part of how things are presented. So I'm kind of a romantic too as well. I like things that look good. I believe in beauty, um, and I believe in the uh, the way that the um, uh, that uh, that we as people come to appreciate things through the aesthetics, through the way that we see things. So those uh, those sort of play out on the baseline level of things. That's an excellent segue. The word beauty is that uh, you have a, a magnificent series of photographs, which I think the title is like a point, it's called The Terrible Beauties. And uh, this is a project that you've been working on for some time, but I think really came to become more concrete for this show. And we can see one on the left-hand side uh, in the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is like this, something about this work that like immediately we're attracted to the aesthetic part of it, color, form, uh, but we don't necessarily know what it is. Uh, what are the Terrible Beauties? Well, Terrible Beauties are uh, like a sub uh, title for a, a, a body of work that is interested in and looking at uh, found objects as uh, those things that are would be normally unseen or overlooked. And they're not necessarily beautiful in and of themselves. Uh, because of their implications. So within the object and this, uh, the image in the center, the framed image is an example of something that was found that, uh, that we found actually on a beach, which is a kind of a common place to find things because they either wash up or uh, beaches are also used as places for, to hide things uh, because uh, they can also be washed away and taken away. So this one in particular, these, uh, a lot of these images were found on beaches and they're, they're just remnants. They're, they're fragments of something that used to be that uh, got buried and then unearthed through the action of, um, of, uh, of time and, and uh, wave action and just erosion in a certain way. And they come about and these things appear and, and they look quite um, uh, as objects, as formal objects are quite beautiful, uh, particularly the way they're presented uh, in the photograph, which is to take them and set them up in a way that isolates them from their whatever, you know, their natural environment from which they were taken and present them as things of beauty, even though they are terrible because of what their implications are. They come from the, the leftovers and the those things that uh, we disregard and uh, are we're finished with as and when I say we I mean it as a, a collective uh, sort of part of civilization or part of society these things that just sort of wash up on the shores of our of our uh, almost memory of, of what used to be and and but they're no longer useful anymore so but they f I find that they speak quite loudly and quite strongly to this um, this effect that uh, that the Anthropocene, as it's been called, has upon the planet. 
So they're garbage essentially, and garbage is terrible. Uh, yeah, and they have they you know in their implication for a waste of resources and uh, uh, not to mention some of the uh, uh, the buildup of uh, in how it uh, uh, appears on our landscapes. But they're beautiful because of the way I presented them, also because of their implications for the uh, societal prosperity. Like so, and as an example, in Rome there is a pile of shards of amphora. The amphora were the clay vessels that were used to transport, among other things, wine and, and uh, olive oil uh, back in the day in the Roman, uh, during the Roman era. And this pile is over 300 meters high and on Google Maps, it, uh, you can actually see it. Uh, it's an archaeological site. Um, it uh, is a marker of uh, sort of how civilization worked, but it's also meaning worked in sort of a, from an archaeological perspective. We find out about how society was. Um, these the, and also at the same time, it was a marker and a, of prosperity for the Romans because they could just throw these things away and build new ones, and and they were continuing in the economy of whatever it was that they that their society required. And these things, that's kind of interesting. And so these objects that we have that I've presented here sort of reflect that kind of thing too as well. And I see that within the, the landfills and the dumps that we, um, that we uh, where we accumulate some of that debris. It's a, it's a sign of prosperity in our culture yeah. too as well. And yeah, I, uh, when I was sitting at McGill and in some of my archeology span classes, um, based on what you do find in landfills from the past, you can see how much trade a uh, culture had with other areas, uh, how much decoration that they were putting on their amphoras, for example, how much time they had, the materials that they were using. And it tells you a lot about the different patterns that that culture had and how mm -hmm. rich they were in terms of wealth uh, with other nations. And uh, I find how the way that you presented them, this is very pure white background with the reflection of the object uh, from what I understand, you were taking these on a piece of polished plexi and to get that very white, clean background. And overall, what are some of these objects that we're looking at? I think one was a glove or a piece of leather. Yeah, there's, uh, well, the one actually in this image here that we see in the very center between the two figures is what I call leather-like because it reminded me of that. But it's, it's a piece of sort of like vinyl that has been contorted and changed and it found its shape in this sort of, uh, I don't know, beautiful kind of leaf-like, um, dried leaf-like thing. And it, and it, it has a, a weight in the center of that's a piece of rusted metal. I have no idea what these things, where they come from. Uh, they're, they're one that has patterns on it that suggests that perhaps it's a rubber glove, like something that would have been used to wash dishes or protect your hands and various things. The green object on the left there, I have no idea. It's just this, I call it green and gray because of the basic colors that are in it. So some of them sort of look like maybe shells, uh, but they're squished and compressed uh, translucent white water bottles, uh, or at least liquid sort of vessels, vessels for holding liquid. And so they're, they're kind of, that's kind of the other interesting thing is that they're not really discernible, like in terms of what their, what their function or what they're, what they were used for. And that's a lot to, that, that speaks a lot to how we, uh, what we, how we try to, how we're understanding these objects after the fact, after they've changed uh, over time, you know. How they uh, break down and erode yeah. and leave remnants in our uh, society and in our environment. It's yeah. been fascinating to see people's reactions as they come into the gallery um, because you have a number of different aspects that immediately draw people's attention is that these right off the bat, there's an aesthetic quality that people come in, they're attracted very much to the, the elegance, the simplicity, uh, the beautiful colors and shapes of these pieces. And then when uh, we have a discussion with them, Emily and myself, uh, we're able to talk about like the, uh, this like nice, uh, we'll call it juicy cohesion to what the work is about and this is when I come back to the idea of the terrible beauties being like such a, a great title is that uh, there is that aspect of being conscious of, uh, of our environment and how art 
is able to speak to you just beyond the necessary, like it's a beautiful object. And mm -hmm. the, the series has a lot of substance to it. And which gives me, uh, as we look in this picture right now, we see in the middle of the floor, there's a pile of objects. And this is something that I think is very uh, much a trademark of your uh, artwork and your career. These objects that are um, made out of wax and here, this is a fascinating contrast between your photographs, which have that aesthetic beauty to them that we don't know what they are. And then we have to have that uh, explanation uh, that to, to figure out what they are versus the objects that we have in the middle, which are uh, simply based on form. And there is no color and there is no branding, but yet we can easily recognize uh, what the objects are. Yeah, well, and actually, in fact, that was uh, the, these objects uh, yeah, are things that were part of more of a performance aspect of my work, whereas I would go for walks and I would clean up as I was walking. So I would pick up litter and garbage as I found it. And these would be left in their place as sort of like a marker, something that could be uh, used to signify the changes that I did. However, trivial or are or, or somewhat invisible uh, there they were and the objects themselves were um, cast directly from objects that I picked up so from the garbage and from the litter that I found and reproduced in and remade into these hollow cast versions or replicas of, uh, of the original in beeswax um the uh the they sort of even carry their the kind of volume and sense of space that the object would have originally taken up uh but they're as you said they're they're completely devoid of any reference to marks or or type or branding with the exception of whatever was on relief on these things that you might have been able to find that they 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 become a valued object all of a sudden you wouldn't necessarily one wouldn't necessarily pick up the object after I had passed by and, and uh, or at least before perhaps and pick up some of these things that weren't cast in wax, they, they're just garbage. They're not particularly in, um, uh, appealing, but put them in a different um, uh, material and they become, uh, their values are uh, uh, sort of uh, become, it becomes more uh, appreciated and they, uh, and the object, the shape and the form. So I get back to that in a certain way is actually then comes into the forefront. So this thing, now here's a Tim Hortons mug, which we see lots of, but uh, the shape and form is in and of itself becomes interesting. And then there's the implication of what it is, where it was found and yeah. what it implies to uh, much like those terrible beauties as well. So I love this uh, full circle of your art craft. This is it like the object is something, I think Tim Hortons cups are some of the most uh, objects that we find in our, as waste in Canada. And uh, how the full circle idea is that you picked up this piece, you made a mole of it um, uh, out of plaster, you put something very organic to create a shape which has a very distinct color, and you turned it into a precious piece of art. And in here mm -hmm. we have it on this podium right now that uh, we have in the gallery. And uh, I, I just love this full circle idea that you present in your work, how even though uh, you do have a dialogue about something that is harmful to the environment, uh, you're still using art as a way to uh, express some very uh, interesting ideas about aesthetic and the complexities of how humans are uh, having an effect on their environment. Yeah. So I think that this is a very apt point. Well, and the, the use of beeswax too is uh, particularly important. I mean, uh, as a visceral, as a, as a material, it's very visceral for me. In other words, uh, the, the smell, I love the smell of beeswax. The feel, you know, if it's not too hot, but you know, the residue, that, that sort of softness uh, and, uh, and its malleability, the, ch the, the, the opportunity for it to change shape and form. Uh, fairly easily given the molding process is something that I particularly like but I also uh, um, I it does I'm not it's not lost on me the 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 metaphor the 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 symbolism within the use of beeswax and bees in particular and their their uh, their um, uh, the the use of bees and the bee 
culture, as it were, as a metaphor for, you know, for civilization has been around since, well, since civilization, since there's been, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, colonization or at least uh, uh, a grouping of people together that have used various aspects in the, society, in the natural environment to be able to survive. So the bees have been around forever and that metaphor is not lost on the, the hierarchy within the, the community of bees uh, that we have named them, uh, even though they don't necessarily adhere to it, but there's that that is also reflected in our own society, the idea of work, about class, about uh, material and uh, structure, I think is pretty important uh, as well. It's something that's well, well written about, and well known. So I, I appreciate that very much. So. On the screen right now, we can see some uh, bricks made out of beeswax. And you had done a project recently with the city of Montreal in Dare Dare, where you had produced um, a multitude of these bricks that you were building forms. And then every week you would return back to the site. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about this project that you worked on? Yeah, this, uh, these are the, uh, the few pieces that remain from the project. It was a, a project that actually began and was its first uh, part or first uh, version was in 2004 and it was outside and there was a series of about 1500 bricks of this kind in other words the three holes they're all hollow cast in beeswax and they were stacked or piled in a in a rudimentary tower shape three of them about anywhere from six to eight feet high three feet wide and or three feet square, and they would um, they were outside, so they were susceptible to the environment, uh, natural and man-made, or at least man-induced, I guess. So they were vandalized, and they changed. The sun heated it up. They fell. Uh, there was uh, various kinds of um, uh, well environmental pressure, I guess, on this thing, and it would always change. So I would the idea was that I would come in and I would separate out all the pieces that were broken. Uh, they were unusable and then rebuild the tower as much as I could uh, using the bricks that were still whole at least strong enough or, or whole enough to be able to create these these towers eventually it became nothing more than a dilapidated version a very small dilapidated version of itself and this is a reflection for me of some of the things that are ongoing in our um, cities uh, in the in the the, the built out uh, built out of necessity landscapes, the the architecture is constantly undergoing yeah. uh, change through the environmental pressures plus uh, the change that's brought on by uh, repair and maintenance that to maintain and to keep it in some form of usefulness. So those sorts of things were very much part of that uh, that project, and it's an ongoing thing. Like that, these projects are things that, and that was uh, the one that was happened last summer was the fourth version of it. It had been shown in uh, a, a north of Toronto. It was in uh, out west in Calgary, and uh, it's been shown now twice in Montreal as uh, an actual sort of live or living. Um, and changing uh, performance and installation of work that uh, can be interacted with and uh, with the city. Uh, so, but uh, I, I have people coming in and they definitely recognize the wax objects because you leave them out in the environment. I know that you've done projects where you've picked up the real garbage uh, in bags to show how much garbage has been in that one particular spot, and you leave the organic wax equivalent. And I think as people walk by, they can just see how much garbage that they don't really see anymore, that they just kind of ignore. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the people coming in, they're like, oh, yes, I saw that project on the Lachine Canal, or I saw it by the Atwater Market, et cetera. And it's interesting how it's become very much associated to your art practice. Yeah. Uh, in, in this photograph right here, you can see uh, with the mountain ranges, and then you're standing on these mountains of, uh, of mattresses and drywall in this contrast between the environment and you being king of the uh, king of the mountain yourself, <laughs> this king of the mountain of garbage. Um, when you're on these expeditions, uh, you, you get permits to go on them. Uh, some of them you're saying were clandestine. Uh, yeah, th this this one in particular is more of uh, there's permissions that were required. It was essentially just uh, speaking with the uh, with the uh, authorities, the local um, authority, to allow for access in this kind of way, 
to be able to put myself in the landfill, which is, you know, it's harder to do now and now we now nowadays we're not allowed to enter these places because of certain kinds of toxicity or, uh, you know, even heavy equipment that's moving around. This one in particular was a place uh, in the mountains, not far from Canmore, and uh, they had a small landfill and uh, they accepted waste and they would sort it by kind. So there's uh, mattresses, which are very hard to get rid of because of their bulkiness. And there's um, uh, this drywall, which could be recycled and reused. Uh, and various other things, concrete, asphalt, shingles. Uh, there's a number of different kinds of piles of things. And the figure, which is me, is my persona in the work, which is the wanderer or the, war or the rubbish picker, who has, in this particular case, had walked from Banff to this dump and uh, with some garbage to deposit it. And uh, uh, as a result, st stood upon... Uh, these piles as a form of scale. So the human figure as scale to the, the relative size and the accumulation of this waste. And also um, the, the sort of, again, that, that sort of sublime aspect of the terribleness and the, uh, and the beauty of it at the same time. So, uh, which is a reference to, um, th these ones a particular reference to uh, Caspar David Friedrich's uh, painting The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, which yeah. uh, has a figure who uh, is standing on a precipice uh, looking out over uh, this sea of fog. And it's considered a sublime um, romantic uh, painting from the early 1800s that um, uh, talks about that duality within the sublime of both being beautiful because of the landscape, but also terrible in the sense of like the landscape could engulf him. He could fall to his death. He could jump to his death kind of thing. And uh, so there, it's- you definitely it's, paint a very romantic figure. Though. Yes, those are the kinds of things that I, yeah. So it's interesting that way. So. Uh, on the screen right now, we have uh, the out of order uh, neon tubes um, which I have, well, I have some of these in my own personal collection. I absolutely love this series. Um, what are we looking at when we look at these tubes? Uh, what do we see there? They really nice colors. Yeah, there, there's some, uh, uh, the, 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 the physical description of them are glass tubes that are anywhere from um, five eighths to an inch or sorry, a half inch in diameter. And they're filled with a, a liquid, the liquid is isopropyl, basically, so it doesn't um, uh, change or uh, like water could, and it has no particulate matter in it. And there's a natural dye in there, which keeps it translucent, but uh, taints or stains or uh, uh, dyes that color. These are objects, uh, this one is more uh, random in terms of how they were put together and how they're displayed. And there's a, a, a uh, for me, there's a reference, there's a, there's a double kind of reference. There's an accumulation of information and data that we have uh, that becomes this sort of, uh, um, uh, 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 well, it becomes this information that is oftentimes superfluous or too much, and they, it accumulates in a way that um, um, sort of informs but doesn't inform uh, things at the same time because of its uh, uh, abundance, meaning abundance of information. Uh, the, the, there's a, a reference to graphing and the, the, um, the, the drawn or uh, uh, graphic aspect of the way data is presented. Uh, this one has a, a panel on the left that is more uh, perhaps uh, referencing that kind of um, uh, way, but in a more random way, in a more abstract and a more formalist um, thing, uh, or at least a presentation of that kind of information. So it's formal. It has. Uh, it also has its references in tools and this idea of balance and levels. So some of the materials in levels are used in uh, this isopropyl and this coloring to be able to find out the the, uh, the the levelness or the the balance of things, so that we can uh, so make sure that various aspects are are uh, in. We can, we can see in this picture the curator Alicia Yapoy, who had uh, uh, really fallen in love with your work and uh, this uh, out of order series. I uh, started with the the group show, the Beyond Semantics at the gallery, and I think you've taken it to the next level. 
for your solo show and uh, you have all kinds of different ways that you're able to manipulate these tubes to create uh, these just these very elegant, beautiful forms. Well, I think that the, I think the beauty is still there within it. I mean, it's part of this idea dealing with, uh, you know, here and how the shapes uh, sort of create a sense of depth within the, that more or less flat form. Um, and they're, uh, they, they have uh, a very physical aspect to them too, as well with the glass being uh, physically held in place on a, in this case, on a panel. Uh, I think that's also, it, it just, uh, it has that sort of, it keeps, it maintains the, uh, that sort of sense of beauty and that sense, sense of uh, balance, I guess. And these are all, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that uh, you're very hands-on and you're, you've got a lot of knowledge, not only about the art world, but also a lot of ways that you can manipulate materials, uh, framing, uh, boards, glass tubes, like these are done with uh, blow torches and then these panels you put together yourself and then you're gonna make the, the brackets yourself and you've inserted them so that people don't see the screw, like you're very uh, manual uh, as well as somebody who has a very artistic side to what you're doing. So I think that like when I look at such a work, I appreciate the the quality of the, the the worksmanship that goes into it along with the uh the message that you're putting out in your work well thank you i think that uh i i really am fascinated also with craft and with the attention to detail that craft um, also employs uh and is necessary and a lot of works uh for me at any rate that sort of attention to detail comes through um uh in the manual application of materials and tools and uh, my my studio is basically filled with um, some of the reminders for me to be able to work with uh, kinds of materials and shapes and forms but also the tools that I can uh, that I that I'll need um, to be able to work on these things so it's a bit of a it's a workshop uh, for somebody who's a bit of a bricoleur so somebody that pulls together things as necessary to be able to make stuff that seems to fit within, and in this particular case, to work with uh, the end goal of having an exhibition and working on various kinds of materials. Yeah, well, you've been an artist who has uh, been in the art scene in Montreal for a very long time. You've been involved with uh, many projects, uh, like the, for example, the Pizza Envelope Urbaine, um, and I find that um, for this solo show for Sightlines, I feel like um, being part of a commercial gallery is taking uh, the Douglas Scholes, who's got such a strong uh, artist statement and then having to produce something that is uh, more in, in the commercial sense, uh, more domesticated and less site specific <laughs> and more less uh, city uh, project, a less provincial project, less residency and having putting together something that somebody can envision being part of their collection. Yeah. And uh, did you find this show to be a challenge or did you uh, embrace it as it came along? Well, I mean, uh, it definitely a challenge and I embraced it. I embraced the challenge. It was uh, a way to be able to uh, also uh, express or use um, some of my uh, experiences uh, and some of the ideas. So uh, oftentimes working in where I was, well, I, w I have been working for many years through the artist run center community, um, which is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's linked to universities and academia. It's linked to more conceptual and experimental works um, of various levels. And so there was a great outlet to be able to work through some of these ideas that I had in mind that were not necessarily focusing on these, on the idea of, uh, of um, uh, a commercial side of things. Um, uh, the, the, the challenge of working in this, in a commercial gallery for me was to be able to rein in some of the, uh, the, 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 the things that I would want to make in a way that allowed for uh, a, real, uh, a, a, a real presentation of the ideas that was cohesive. And like you said, like it's a different kind of way of thinking 
which I think is very healthy. Uh, it's very informative for me in terms of how it is that um, uh, even to be able to see it in a way that I can understand, oh, that's why I'm doing things in this kind of way, or that's, these are the kind of things that interest me. And I, in some cases, I never really had a chance to express them in a way that I, uh, that I can when I'm in the, the Robertson and Erez gallery. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's just a great opportunity to be able to bring the, these sides of me together. So. And then this uh, this piece, uh, I think, is like a nice little personal touch. This is something that, uh, for those of you who have had the uh, privilege of visiting Doug's uh, studio, is that uh, you are the, uh, we'll call it the, the master of kitsch and the master of collecting these objects that you find. And then here we see that you're playing with these uh, different uh, treasures that you found and put together. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this is kind of like a little exclamation mark on the, on the show. Um, well, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, it, these things are, are always meant to be handled and played with uh, even in sort of uh, if they're uh, photographs, but uh, as an artist who uh, also is very much involved in, in, in the body, my, my, my being or the being of the person as part of how the work is animated or becomes animated or becomes part of a, a bigger uh, conversation, I guess. As you were mentioning, you have a uh, personality that's involved in performance art with the rubbish picker, the wanderer, and uh, there's all kinds of videos that I uh, that you've done that we can find on your Vimeo channel. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a, a pretty thick CV of different projects that you've been involved in. Uh, so, uh, Doug, it's been a true pleasure. I absolutely love seeing uh, how your career is evolving. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you're going to evolve to the next step for the next uh, solo or group show that we're going to have at the gallery. It's been a true pleasure. And uh, well, thank you very much for steam being tuned. Well, I'll keep looking for more work because I'm going to keep working now. So, uh, oh, well, like always, so there'll be more stuff. So, but thank you very much. I appreciate the, the time and uh, thanks uh, everybody to, uh, for watching and listening too. So thank you. Have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye-bye.